I am at home and sick of all the Quentin Quarantino movies because I've watched a lot. And I just figured that we would go through what's in my bag and my cases and all this stuff over here and those lenses and these lenses. But before I do that, I just want to let you guys know that I am hearing you. And uh, I started a new channel right here. So this is called David's Random. The link will be in the description, and I really hope that you guys can go to this channel, subscribe to it. I want to get some traction on this, uh, but this is everything that I do beyond photography. So my first video is I got my Porsche 928 from a con artist, and it's it's true. It's a crazy, crazy story. Enough of that. Um, so let's let's just dive in and start looking at glass. So the reason why I'm telling you guys about this is because there is the right tool for the right time and lenses are designed differently from each other and if you want to get into professional photography, unfortunately this is one of those things that you have to think about. It's having the right tool for the right job and each lens has its own specific purpose, really what it was designed for, just like a wrench. You know, you don't use a crescent wrench to fix everything, you use a set of wrenches. Lenses are no different. Let's start with the shelf. Um, because the shelf is where things go to die, kind of. Let's just do a quick rundown. So, the Sigma 56mm uh, f1.4. I just reviewed this and it's an amazing lens. Unfortunately, I sold my a6400 to Noah, my last assistant. And so, now I'm going to have to sell this lens. So, that's probably going to go on eBay. But anyway. Uh, the Rokinon 35mm f1.4, I brought that home to compare it to another lens. I've already reviewed this, you guys know that. This one's kind of weird. So if you're looking for a small telephoto lens, it's manual focus. This is the Zhongyi Creator. And Oshiro also makes one that's about the same size. This is a 135mm f2.8. They're decent, they're not great, there's some chromatic aberrations. They're not as sharp as they could be wide open, but it's like a $160 lens. I doubt I'll ever review it, and I'll probably just turn around and sell it. So there. Remember this? This is the Sony QX100. It was the clip-on 20 megapixel camera that you would stick on your phone. Still kind of a cool little camera, but I haven't used it. I probably haven't turned it on in three years. So this is the smallest 90 millimeter that you can possibly buy, and this is the Carl Zeiss Sonar T 90 millimeter f 2.8, and it's a Contax film camera lens. Anyway, Photodeox makes an adapter for it. The only problem is the lens has a hard time staying on the adapter. Very sharp, some chromatic aberrations, still not bad if you want to travel small. So there's an option. Ooh. Two lenses that are actually decent that I have never reviewed. So the Mike 85mm uh, f2.8 macro lens, and this is the 1 to 5x. I need to review this for you guys. I plan on doing a macro video next week. I'll break this out then. Um, I got it and it just sat here. I haven't played with it. This is the Rokinon 135mm f2 manual focus lens. This is an AI lens adapted to Sony NEX via Photassi adapter. Great lens. Killer, killer lens. Phenomenal bokeh, extremely sharp, just manual focus. There's been a ton of reviews on this lens. If you know about it, you already know it's good. They're fairly cheap. You can buy them really cheap used on eBay. I think I got this one for like 200 bucks, and it was a steal, and I love that thing. Okay, next row. So down here, you can see I have a ton of filters too. Down here, this is my Nikon 105mm f2.5 vintage non-AI lens. And this lens is in mint condition. And I, I love this stupid lens. Um, it's a great travel portrait lens. 105 millimeters, that is tiny. It fits in your bag really easily. 105 millimeter has is, is got some pretty good reach and it's a decent portrait lens. Uh, it's nice at f2.5, excellent at f4, and comes with a metal lens hood, which is kind of cool. Down to this row. This 35mm f1.7 um, Fotassi lens, this is like a $50, $40 lens. These are terrible. It's a CCTV lens. Never liked it. 
Fits on APS-C size, but image quality just kind of sucks. The Micro Nikkor 55mm f2.8, I built my business on this lens. So I have owned this particular lens maybe 15 years. I've probably torn it apart and cleaned it four or five times. This is the only lens that I actually have a service manual on because that's how much I used it. It has no barrel distortion, no chromatic aberrations. The only problem is it's a little soft in the extreme corners. Um, this was my go-to everyday do everything studio lens and it's a great macro lens. It's only a one to two so it doesn't get super close but with adapters you can make it go bonkers. Just a great lens but nowadays it just sits. So this one this is a cool little lens if you shoot with micro four thirds or APS-C size. So this is the toy lens. I don't know if it's Fotasi or what it is. Um, if you just look up toy lens 26 millimeter on Adorama, you're going to find it. Uh, it's a cool little lens. It doesn't shoot that great wide open, but stop it down to f5.6. And the reason why I love it is because it looks like a vintage Petzval lens when you're actually shooting with it. And here's a couple of photos that I actually took with it. So here's a lens that I don't use every day that's actually a bomb lens. Uh, this is the Lens Baby 35mm Composer Pro. And I've used Lens Babies quite a lot throughout the years. I love the effects of these. If I'm doing something, especially with musicians, I love to break this out because this gives a little bit of motion to what you're doing. And you can do some really nice artistic stuff with this. Um, here's a few photos I've taken with this. I love this thing. This is a Nikon AI mount um, adapted so you can just use an adapter on, on Sony. That's what I do. Uh, the last one, artistic-wise, is this one. And this is my... Zenitar, let me just set it down here, 16 millimeter f2.8 fisheye, and there's something on it. These are amazing. I bought this new maybe 10 years ago, and they don't sell them anymore uh, new, but if you can find one used, just make sure that it focuses to infinity. If not, you have to do a little work to get it to focus to infinity. Image quality is excellent, and the lens elements are excellent, but the construction of the actual lens, albeit it's all metal and it's very strong, uh, quality control is always a little bit of an issue, so a lot of them didn't actually focus to infinity. Once that's set, this thing is the easiest lens to use, and this is what images look like taken with this lens. The Tamron 24mm f2.8. I am going to review this lens for you next week. So I'm just giving you a heads up. It's not great. It's not bad. It's just different. And I'll explain why in the review. I hope you guys look forward to that one. But that is the end of the crap that's on the shelf. The only other thing I want to add to that are telephotos. So I am not a telephoto guy. And this should make it fairly obvious. Uh, we're talking, this is like a $120 lens. This is a 500 millimeter five star lens. Uh, this is a, uh, an Olympus 300 millimeter f4.5 lens, OM. This is a great lens. And then this is an old Nikon um, Yashica 400 millimeter f6.3 lens. And Basically, when it comes to telephoto, if, if you're shooting birds and sports or whatever, you need autofocus, you're going to buy a good lens. But if you're like me and you don't shoot telephoto that often, like I use these for shooting the moon. That's my primary goal. Where are you going? Stay there. God damn it. Anyway, uh, so if you really want to get into telephoto, don't be afraid to get a cheap one. The nice thing about telephoto lenses is, is if you can find them and they're dust free, you can pretty much adapt anything. And telephotos are a different style of optics. They're very simple. So usually you can find them to where they're actually pretty sharp. So that's the reason why I hung on to these is because these just all work. 
And they're manual focus and they're kind of a pain in the ass, but you know, I use them like, I don't know, twice a year. That's it. So anyway, enough of that. Let's dive into the studio gear. <sighs> so here is the studio setup. Now in here is the lenses that I use every day. This is mission critical. And these are a big deal. Cody, what are you doing? There's a cat over here in the corner. Anyway, uh, let me talk about what I actually use in the studio. So this is the a7R4. And this camera does not go outside unless I'm working around the studio. Uh, but typically it stays inside just to keep it dust free. Now the Sigma 50 millimeter f1.4. This is the sharpest lens on the planet. And especially at 50 millimeter, there's nothing better than that. Now this is the Canon mount, and I've used this since the Canon 5DSR. And basically what I did is just adapted it with the Sigma MC11 adapter onto here. It still works killer. It's my everyday go-to. Has a helio pan polarizer on it. Uh, this is just an absolute must for doing mission critical, optically perfect images in the studio. This is the Leala 100mm f2.8 that I reviewed about, I don't know, two months ago. This is a great lens, don't get me wrong. There's no problems with it. It's in my studio case for a reason, because it's great. But, over here, this is the Leala 60mm macro that came out, I don't know, it was like four or five years ago. This is also a killer macro lens, and this is what I shoot most of my jewelry with. My biggest mistake with these lenses is I should have got this lens like I did this one. This is a Nikon mount. I don't know why I didn't get this in Nikon. For some reason I decided to get it in Sony E. The reason why that screws me up is because on this one I always use a tilt adapter to be able to tilt the lens down. For some reason maybe I thought electrical contacts were coming with it or something. Uh, but no. So I should have got it just like this. Um, tilt. This lens, I never reviewed it, but it is just stupid sharp. And the thing with this lens is it doesn't really cover uh, full frame when you're focusing in infinity, but when you're in macro mode it definitely does. So this is a great macro lens if that's what you're primarily doing. Now if you're shooting on an A6400 or something like that, you're going to get full frame coverage and you can use this out in the field. And it'll shoot to infinity just fine. So anyway, that was my biggest mistake. Why didn't I get the tilt adapter on there? I don't know. Stupid. So I may end up selling this one eventually and buying an icon version of it just so I can be able to tilt correctly. I'll do a macro video in the next couple of weeks so you can see what these are like and I'll explain that a little bit better. Uh, over here, this is my wide. And so this is the Tokina Farin 20 millimeter f2 wide angle lens. Uh, this lens is killer and you know I don't think I ever talked about this either. So this is the Polar Pro crystalline series. Uh, this is a polarizer and neutral density filter all in one. This thing is great. So it's like a, an 8x neutral density filter and a polarizer and thing just makes so much sense. So if you do a lot of landscape work and you want to be able to slow things down plus darken the sky, this is definitely the way to go. Uh, this lens has served me well. And it is the sharpest 20 millimeter I've found so far. Uh, there's hardly any distortion. The corners are really tight. At f2, it's awesome wide open. It has killer coma. It's great for shooting stars. It is not weather sealed. So you do have to worry about using it in like a dust storm or heavy rain. But I've used this in light rain plenty of times. It's fine. The thing that's great about this is it actually has the electrical connections on it. And this lens is the only lens that I've found so far that works on Sony FE cameras the way it's supposed to. And let me just show you what I'm talking about. What I love about it, and nobody else does this, is the second you turn your focusing ring, it automatically magnifies for you. Uh, it helps you find focus really fast and then when stopping it down of course it appropriately meters for everything and just goes through the gamut. So 
definitely love this lens for the way it works manually. Now, autofocus wise, they do make an autofocus version of this lens. I did try it, and I'll be honest with you, I did not like it. Um, I felt that the autofocus just felt chintzy and cheap, and the metal version just feels so much more robust. Last but not least, what, what else is in my bag here besides memory card? Uh, the Godox X2T transmitter. I love this transmitter. I haven't reviewed it. I should. Um, I'm going to do a Godox update at some point. The thing I like about it versus the X1T is you've got A, B, C, and D up here for kind of a quick selection. And it also has this dial that allows you to change things quickly. So that is really nice. This is just very straightforward, easy to use. The color checker. I don't know how many of you out there actually use color checkers. This is a pretty big deal for me, and it doesn't really matter if it's X-Rite or Data Color. Uh, a lot of people think they're different. They are actually the same chart, just arranged differently. Meaning they have the same color tiles, they're just in a different layout. So it doesn't matter if you get X-Rite or Data Color, but I do recommend that you have one of these. When I'm off-site, what I do is I'll take a shot in the general direction with this in the shot, and then I can color correct it just using the white balance and then verify the color just by going through and matching these colors by adjusting manually in RAW. That's pretty much how I use it. You can also use a profile calibrator, which I think works okay, but it's not super accurate. It still kind of oversaturates colors. But anyway, um, a must have in the studio bag. I will be reviewing this in the next month or so. This is the Sony 35 millimeter F1.8. And I love this stupid lens, and you'll see why later on. Obviously, it's in my studio bag. That means that it is clinically excellent, and it's staying in here. So anyway, there we go. Let's move on to the field bag. Okay, here is my field bag. Very old and gross. Uh, flip, flip side 300 bag. Every time I, my camera bag shows up in the video, I have to explain these. The reason why I like these over any other bag is because when you take a camera bag off, you lay it on the ground this way. And basically what that means is you can access your camera gear this way. If you're traveling, nobody can break into your camera bag because the zipper is against your back. And uh, if you lay this down, you're not putting the dirty side of the bag back on your back. So your shirt stays clean. This is the Sony a7R III. My Old and trust A7R3. Right now it has a Rokinon 45mm f1.8 lens on here. And I just love this for a general purpose lens. I think it's great. It's small, tidy, and sharp. And pretty much good for out in the field. Over here, this is a lens that I need to review for you guys. So this is the Viltrox 85mm f1.8 lens. And I ended up selling my Sony 85mm f1.8 in favor of this lens. Just the bokeh and contrast of this lens overall, it's just, it's just more pleasing. It just has a, I don't know, it's smoother. That's the only way I can describe it. Uh, so I, I think it just gives a very clean rendered image. It's not quite as sharp as the 85mm f1.8 or the Zeiss 85mm f1.8, but it's consistently smooth across and it's consistently sharp across the frame and it's sharp all the way from 1.8 all the way through I think this goes to f16 uh, the only thing is it doesn't have an eye focus button so I have to assign the button on the camera body for something different but this thing is like 400 bucks and it's a steal and I've used this a lot and so far this is holding up I did want to wait to do a review on this because I wanted to make sure that it was going to hold up because this is Viltrox's first autofocus lens, but the autofocus on this is really pretty good. I will be reviewing it. I highly recommend it. It's a great lens. So this is the Irix um, 15mm f1.4. This is a great lens. The only problem is Irix won't get around to making this in Sony FE mount. They told me they would, but they still haven't yet. And out of all the adapters out here, um, the Viltrox adapter is pretty much the only one that works mostly consistently with this. This lens, what you need to know about it is it has a focus lock ring. So once you find your focus, you can actually lock it down if you want. 
uh, f-stop is controlled internally, but it's a manual focus lens. It is fully weather sealed. Uh, on Canon mount, which this one is, it actually has a nice rubber flexible seal ring that goes around the edge here. Unfortunately, when it's adapted to Sony, you can see the, the base gasket doesn't even touch the adapter. And of course the adapter isn't weather sealed either, so yeah, it kind of negates it. What I really like about this lens is this is my architectural lens for a reason. A, it's wider than my 20 millimeter, so I can get more in. B, when I'm shooting architectural stuff, I always crop in no matter what. C, uh, it actually takes screw-on filters, and it's the only super wide-angle lens that will allow you to do that. So at its price point, it's just kind of a no-brainer. It takes a lens hood um, that's not on here right now, and I have this adapted. So this is a 105 millimeter ring down to 95 to kind of cure the vignetting. And then I've got a Vivitar Series 1 uh, circular polarizer on here. Basically, uh, this lens is stupid sharp all through all the f-stops. It has great coma, good for shooting stars. There's just a little bit of spherical barrel distortion that you have to remove, but this is a great lens. The reason why I say this is the best value for 15 millimeter, even though I had to do all this stuff to this lens, get the circular polarizer, the adapter ring, the lens itself, the adapter to mount it to the camera, all of this total is 550 bucks. So it's still a steal, even though you have to adapt it. I just hate not fully recommending it because I know IRIX isn't going to get around to doing an FE mount anytime soon. If they did, I would fully just say, you know, dive on. Now the only other lens that's in here is the uh, Tamron 28-75 to f2.8. This is my wedding event people crap moving around lens. This is just a good overall zoom. I've already reviewed this and I'm sure you've already seen the reviews, but it's just a great zoom. And it's really practical and it's light and it's comfortable and it's great for hanging around your neck at weddings for that last five to six hours, it's not gonna, you know, wear you down. Just a great lens, it's holding up very well. This is my infrared bag, and this is a flip side 200 in black, so it's a little smaller. And this is my A7R converted infrared that you guys have already seen. Look at this lens. I just want you guys to check that out. That's the Ibrit, uh 2.4 90 millimeter and this one's made for Sony E-mount. Uh, it covers full frame. It's an extremely small portrait lens and it also happens to be one of the worst lenses ever made even though it doesn't look like it. This also goes by the Kippon name too. Kippon made this for Iberit and then all of a sudden just took it over. These are shit in the real world. The, the beauty of this lens is that it is a very simplistic design. So it's only something like six elements and four groups or something like that. I don't remember exactly because I'm just going off the top of my head. Design-wise, it's beautiful. And elements-wise, it's designed beautifully, but they have the wrong glass in there. They should have some FLD or ED glass, especially at this price point. I think these are still 450 bucks somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's one massive chromatic aberration. It is sharp, but it's terrible. I was going to review it and bag on it and really hate it, but then I used it on my infrared camera, and it actually seems to work okay and gives it kind of an artistic extra glow. So it stays. It, it has purpose, but it is an awful, awful lens. Anyway, what else is in here? So usually the 20 millimeter Tokina, if I go out with this, I put that in here. Uh, even though that's a complex lens, with infrared you get heat spots in the middle of lenses that have more than, you know, a couple elements. So the Tokina is like 12 elements in 10 groups or something like that. You wouldn't think it would be ideal for infrared, but believe it or not, with the Tokina lens, it's actually a very mild hot spot that shows up in the center. So it's, it's worthy. So it works on here just fine. So that's my wide angle when I'm shooting infrared. Now the other lens I have in here is a little uh, Rokinon 35mm f2.8. 
2.8 FE. And I think I reviewed this a while back. Very simplistic design. Again, this is like, I think, uh, five elements or six elements in five groups or something like that. Really, really simplistic. Very sharp, low chromatic aberrations. Because of its simplistic design, it works great on infrared. There's no hot spots. Just ideal. And it's tiny. That is the lenses that I used. We'll talk to you guys later. Stay safe, stay indoors, wash your hands and your butt, and we'll see you.